Okay, folks. Let's do a sound check. Can you hear me? You guys look like you're expecting something profound today. <laughs> Not going to happen. Um, it's funny, about uh, 12 years ago, my oldest son was getting ready to go off to college, and every one of my kids I was trying to convince to come to NYU. Not because I like NYU, I don't even like the colors that much. <laughs> Purple's not my shade, but, uh, but it's free. I'm saying, this is a good deal. So we go on those college tours. You know the sales pitch here, right? They take you around the college is the greatest place, and they point to buildings and say, and they tell you lies like the professors are always here, and you can find them whenever you want. So we go through the tour for NYU, and I stay in the background. I don't say a thing. And then we get to the, the, the front of the business school, and we're right over this classroom, which is actually the largest classroom in NYU. So the tour guide says, below us is the largest classroom in the university. But don't worry, you will never take a class there, because nobody teaches there. I've actually, this is my room. Not because I like this room, I actually hate this room. It has the ambiance of Madison Square Garden. Have you noticed this? <laughs> yeah. But it is the biggest room in the, in the university, the only room where you can fit in 400 people. So this is not a cozy class. So that's the downside, I'm letting it out. I don't want any of you, when you write your evaluation, you can say anything you want about the class, but if you say it was a large class, what gave you the clue? <laughs> eh? This is a big class, but I'm going to try to teach it like a small class. Eh? This is my 32nd year teaching corporate finance at Stern. And I'll talk about, as we go through this class, I'll talk about what parts of the class have not, if it looks like I'm crying, I am, actually. <laughs> I actually came in overnight on the overnight flight from San Diego, so I'm a little jet lagged, but I'll get over that. Okay? So if I'm crying, it's, it's, it's got nothing to do with you. Okay? But 30, so as I teach this class, I'll talk about what's changed, what hasn't. But today's class is going to be perhaps the most important session of the entire class. I'm saying this for those people who had to miss this class. And there are a few people who said, I'm traveling still. I won't make it here. Okay? Because it's going to kind of give you a sense of what this class is about. Okay? This is not a class about tools and techniques. It's a class that actually lays out a philosophy about think of thinking about business. And hopefully, this class will kind of bring through the points. So let's get started. We have a lot to do. But, but before I get started, let me get a sense of who you are. How many of you are first year MBAs? I should have asked a different question. How many of you are not first year MBAs? <laughs> okay. The reason I did that is I know that you know, one of the things we're going to talk about in this class is creating a group and working in a group. And it's going to be easy for the first year MBAs because you have your little block things that you kind of hang out around. I don't know what you do, but you have beer together and stuff. But by the time you leave the first year, you no longer want to see any MBAs for the rest of your life. So it's going to be a little more difficult for those of you who are not first year MBAs to create the group. But I'll help you along the way, and I'll tell you what I'll do in a few minutes. But let me get the administrative details of this class out of the way first. My office is in the ninth floor of KMEX, the next building. And, uh, my phone number is listed there, but I never answer my phone. <laughs> so you can leave as many voicemails. What I do is I let the voicemail box get full, and then I just empty it out. I never listen to it. So it's just there because it's supposed to be there. The best way to get in touch with me is on my email. And I'm pretty good about answering my emails. If you don't hear back from me within three or four hours, email me again. You're not being a pest, and I'll probably slip through. Because I, I have three classes this semester, all in this room all on Monday and Wednesday, so I own this room on Monday and Wednesday, and they're all about 400 people. So there'll be 1,200 people, so I'll be getting emails. So if I miss your email, it's not because I don't like you, it's because it just slipped through the cracks, so just let me know. 
My office hours are on Mondays and Wednesdays around the classes. But the best time to actually catch me is not during office hours. I have what I call the fair game principle. You know what that is? If you find me, I'm fair game. <laughs> so for the next 15 weeks, my job is to make sure you don't find me. And I do things like I never take the elevator. I always take the stairs. Because in spite of all the hype in the school about getting people to take the stairs, I've noticed that most of you don't. So if you want to catch me, take the stairs. You'll find me probably around the seventh floor, out of breath, ask me the question. But if you catch me, I'm fair game. You'll find out. You've got to do a little research on your own, right? <laughs> Try different stairwells, different, stair different levels of the building. In fact, this has always been my principle. And in previous semesters, people have taken it to a degree that I don't want them to. I remember when Cold Center used to be our gym. That used to be it's still closed, right? They're building something on top of it. And I used to go in the middle of the day or at the end of the day to exercise. And there'd be, I remember one semester, this person in the class would show up consistently at the same time I did, take the treadmill next to mine. <laughs> And ask me questions for the next 35 minutes. So I create, I'm going to create a new rule. If my pulse rate exceeds 100, I am not responsible for any answer that I might give you to any question you ask. But I am fair game if you can find me. The teaching assistants of Miguel and Luis, they're both here. Can you put up your hands, guys? No. There you are. So you know how to find them, but don't harass them. Because anything to do with grading, has to come through me, because I, I grade the, the quizzes. So if there's a screw up on the grading, don't go to them to complain, because it's my, my job. So, so use them as a resource, but don't, you know, if you have problems, issues, questions about the class itself, you know, something to do with the, the, the structure of the class, come to me. For the next 15 weeks, I'm going to take over your life. I know you have other classes you're taking this semester, but frankly, I'm going to drown them out. <laughs> I, will, I, will, I will claim 100% of your time, even though you're not willing to give that. And here's how it's going to play out. So every day of the week, you will hear from me one way or the other. So right after class today, I will send you an email. About what? About the class. <laughs> you think I just came out of the class. Well, let's face it, physically you might have been here, but mentally you might have taken a little break. And I'll review what we did in the class. So it's kind of a review of the class. And starting with the next session, after every class, actually starting with this one, maybe, I'll send you what I call a post-class test. Very simple. It'll take you five minutes, five multiple choice questions to see if you kind of got the concepts in the class with the solutions. So every class, you'll get an email after the class with a post-class test and solution. On Tuesday, I'll put up what I call a corporate finance story of the week. Sounds legendary, but it's not. It'll be some new story that week relating to the topic we're covering that week. I'll put it up, and I'll have a few questions. Given what we talked about, how would you? So it's, it's to kind of get your hands dirty, taking what we've learned in the class and applying it to real new stories, real companies. On Wednesday, of course, another class, another follow-up. On Thursday, you'll get an email related to the project. You're saying, what project? We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But essentially, that's going to run in parallel with the class, and you're going to be doing it. On Friday, I'll send you what I call an in-practice webcast. Basically, it's a webcast about something you have to do on your company. And I'll take you through the process of how I would do it for a company. So you, you at least have a template on. This is where I would look. This is what I would do. Usually, it'll come with an attached spreadsheet on how to use the data, convert it into information for the class. On Friday, you'll get a newsletter. What news? What do we do this week? See, one of the problems, I, and I remember being in large classes, around the eighth or the ninth week, you start to forget where you are in the class. You kind of So this is just, think of it as a GPS for this class. Basically, that this is where we are. This is where we're going, essentially to keep you kind of caught up because life throws things at you and it's easy to get out of the loop. So just a, so there's nothing particularly newsy about this newsletter. It's really to keep you kind of linked to the class. Sunday, I'll send you an email saying, this is what's coming next week, so to get you ready for the next week. 
which means that every day of the week you're going to get an email from us. By the end of the semester, you probably get 116 emails. That's what the last corporate finance class did. If you want to block me, please do. I don't care. <laughs> hey, if you want to create a special smart mailbox just for these emails. But this is the way, I, because I don't use NYU classes. I don't like it. I don't like closed systems. I don't put announcements. I don't even know what's going on in NYU classes. So if you go there, after the first week, it'll look dead. Because everything I want to announce, I will announce through emails. So basically, and I will also create what I call, and you saw this already in the emails I've sent you, what I call an email chronicle, which basically takes every email, puts it into a web page so you can see. So you, basically, I'm going to take away any excuse you can ever have, which is, I did not see that email. No, not working with me, because it's in the email. So every email. So by the time we're done, we're going to have like a 50-page chronicle of the class. So every week for the next 15 weeks, except for the spring break week, when I will leave you alone for a blessed seven days. <laughs> but I'll be counting down, day seven, day six, day five, <laughs> boom, big email at the end of the day. Very few rules in this class. Be here, and if you can, be on time. I'd rather that you be here than not be here. So even if you're running 30 minutes late, in this room, who's going to notice when you come in? So it's not like I'm going to make you the center of attention so you can slip in and slip out. I would rather that you be here. But if you, know, if you cannot be here, I, you know, I, I understand. But if you can be here, you know, be here and try to be on time. I know that this is a great forum to make announcements because you got pretty much the entire first year class here. So rather than make this some um, exercise where you have to come and talk, I'll, I've, I've, I've created a Google shared spreadsheet, and I'll send you the link. But if you want to make an announcement, there's only one announcement per session that I can allow in the first two minutes. So basically say, I want to make an announcement on this particular day, on this particular topic. Go in and take that slot and use your two minutes to talk to the rest of the first years. You have elections and stuff? Is that something? So, because I remember people have all kinds of things they want to announce, club things, and, you know, whatever you want to announce for the first two minutes. The only thing you need to bring to class with you are your lecture notes. And if you have it in PDF format on a device, that's fine. If you want to print it off, that's fine. If you want to pay for it because you feel the bookstore looks impoverished, that's fine too. You know, I don't know why people want to pay $25 when you can just download, but you know. I'm not trying to talk you out of, actually, I am trying to talk you out of using the bookstore. No. But if you want, whatever version it is, make sure you bring the lecture note packet. And if you don't have it, not a big deal. The slides will be up there. It'll make your life a little easier if you have the slides in front of you. And finally, if you do miss a class, I'm going to take away that excuse, too, which I wasn't there. Because you can always keep up with this class. Because the classes will, of course, the webcast will be available. But I'll all, I've also created an iTunes U version of this class where all the classes go on. If you've never used iTunes U, it's actually a pretty neat platform for a class. So basically, I put the class up, the slides were used, the post-class test and solution all put together. So if you have to travel, you're going to go for an interview, you miss a week or two, you're sick, you can always keep up with the class. Yeah. There, I've also created a YouTube version of the, of the class because especially if you want to download it and my vi vision of a great day would be to walk down 57th Street and have somebody watching my <laughs> lecture as they're going, say, this is it, I made it. I'm the Netflix of corporate finance. <laughs> now, <laughs> I even, even created a downloadable audio file because people said, I want to exercise listening to your lecture. Hey, your exercise will be completely boring, but no. So the, each lecture, you'll see a multiple platform. Pick the platform that works for you. Don't try to do all four, because you'll be getting the same thing. But pick whatever you like to catch up on. Almost all the information for the class is on the web page. That's the entry point. And I've sent this link, but if you ha don't have it, if you go to that link, you'll see the whole class play out. The iTunes U version, the YouTube playlist I've already talked about, essentially the whole class will be available on those platforms as well. The Google Calendar I sent to you already, and when I first put it together, I was sitting in California, and I wasn't even thinking about this. I was putting in these times, and was putting it in Pacific time, 
And then I got emails from people saying, is the class really meeting at 7.30 in the, it says, it just moved. so I think I've fixed it all. So basically it should be at the right time. But the Google Calendar will have the quiz dates and the final exam date, and I'll go through those as well so you know exactly when those will be coming. And in terms of additional stuff, I write on my blog. I don't write personal stuff. This is not like a reality show blog. It's really all about corporate finance and valuation. And um, I will direct you towards a blog post if I think it's relevant for the class. But if you just want to read the blog, you're welcome to because it will at least give you a sense of what's coming in the class and how I think about corporate finance topics. I am, uh, I, I've, I've told people this before, I want to be the Lady Gaga of finance. <laughs> and I'm working my way slowly towards it. I reached 96,105 followers on Twitter this morning. But you know what's coming, right? I want six digits on my follower list. With three th if you have multiple emails, <laughs> follow me on all of them. <laughs> Block me, I don't care. All I care about now is just numbers. <laughs> the 100,000 follower will get a prize. I have no idea what it is. So if you want to be the next 3,900 followers by yourself, go for it. Okay? So, but I have a Twitter feed. Again, the Twitter feed is really about corporate finance and valuation. I don't tweet out things like, you know, I ate breakfast this morning and this is what I had. None of that stuff. It'll be almost entirely related to finance. So now let's get launched. How many of you have taken corporate finance before? How many of you have taken corporate finance from me before? Anybody? The reason I ask that is I used to teach the analyst trading programs at all of the investment banks. If you came in through, you know, I've pulled out of that, that gig now, but you know. So how many of you have taken corporate finance before? Doesn't it? Okay. I'm going to put you on the spot. What's your name? Yulia. So I'm going to ask Yulia a question. And any of you can jump in if you think you have a better answer. Okay? Don't read what's on this page because that's not fair. <laughs> We're going to spend the next 15 weeks talking about corporate finance. What is corporate finance? Give me a, give me a working de definition of corporate finance. What is corporate finance? Um, so basically corporate financial decisions. Financial decisions that organizations make. That's actually a pretty good def definition. Let me ask you a question. Is there any decision that an organization makes that is not financial? Like what? Oh, who pays the strategies? And what do they pay them with? In fact, you could say it's a negative financial decision because they spend money and nothing good comes out of it. Okay. But actually, you gave me the perfect definition of corporate finance. Corporate finance covers any decision that involves the use of money. You know how self-serving this definition is? What have I just said? Everything is corporate finance. You just didn't know you were in corporate finance. You thought you were in marketing. Those little PPP games, you pay price, promotion, whatever. It's all corporate finance. What is strategy all about? Coming up with a different pathway for the firm. Why? Not because the pathway looks good and there are flowers glowing on the side, but because it'll change your cash flows, your growth, your risk, and affect value. I know it sounds like a very materialistic definition, but remember, you're in business. Everything is corporate finance. Do you still have that two-week thing before the first, the, before your classes start in late August, that orientation? I call it the brainwashing period, <laughs> where basically you're brought in and told everything you've learned in your life so far is useless, that what you will learn in the next two years is going to change your life. Complete lie, but you've got to go along because that's part of the brainwashing. It's about 10 years ago. They asked me whether I would give a talk during the orientation program about the corporate finance class because for the last 30 years, this is a class that first year MBAs take in the spring and 90% of the first year class ends up in this class. I said, sure. They said, no, come in and talk about your class. I came in and talked. They haven't invited me back since, so I must have done something <laughs> that didn't work out. So I came in with a flow chart about what this class is. I said, this is what corporate finance is. Everything else you're going to do in the program is in service of my class. <laughs> Why do you learn accounting? Because it gives you raw data to make better financial decisions. 
the accountants just are raw data providers as far as I'm concerned. Every other class, this is the ultimate, I know this is self-serving and it's probably biased, but this is your big picture class. This is a class that gathers together everything you do in every other class, it's going to be in there somewhere. I know I shouldn't play favorites, but I will. I teach two classes, corporate finance and valuation. Corporate finance in first years, and for those people who want to come back for the punishment, I hit them with valuation in the second year. And sometimes people say, I can take only one of your two classes, which one should I take? The answer is always the same. You have to take a single class. In business, forget about finance, it's got to be corporate finance. I'm setting myself up for expectations that cannot be met. <laughs> hey, but it's good to set them up high and, not, and reach for them than to set them up low and hit them every single time. So I'm going to start off by laying out the objectives for this class. And I'll show you the same page at the end of the 15th week, because I believe in accountability. And at the end of the 15th week, I'm going to come back to you and say, do you think I met these objectives? I'm going to give you a chance to grade me. So the first objective of this class is to give you the capacity to apply the tools, the techniques, the models, the metrics. And there are lots of them in finance in the real world. This is an applied class, and I'll come back and put some roots on that word too, but everything we do in this class is going to be applied. So if you've taken a corporate finance class before and you compare that to the syllabus of my class, it might not look the same because here's what I did when I went through my syllabus. I went through topic by topic on what I was supposed to teach and asked, can I apply this? And if the answer was no, I said, what the heck am I doing talking about it? So if I cannot apply it, I'm not going to talk about it. So basically, it's not just to give you the tools, but to give you the chance to apply those tools. Second, this is a big picture class. I know you've heard that before. Every class claims to be a big picture class. I mean it. And I will actually make this specific in a minute, but this is a big picture class. It's a class where... I will do what I call elevation, which I'll constantly pull you away from the details because you're going to get stuck in a detail and say, I don't quite get this beta. What is this risk premium thing? And rather than let you wallow there, I'm going to come back and say, let's step back and look at the big picture. Where does this fit in the big picture? Because if you don't get that, you're going to get lost in the details. So the big picture class. So I want to make sure you can apply stuff. I want to make sure you see the big picture. Here's my third objective, and this is going to sound a little sick. I think corporate finance is fun. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have fun for the next 15 weeks. And you have two choices. You can watch me have fun, because I'm going to have the fun anyway. Or you can join in. So if you want to be cynical and say, hey, what's wrong with this guy? Why is he getting excited about capital structure? Right? You can say, I'm excited about capital structure, too. Do I have a little bit of a missionary in me? How many of you are not going to be finance majors? Okay. Here's my vision of a successful class. By the end of this class, I want you to say, I get it now. I've seen the light. <laughs> it'll, be like a, it'll be like one of those you know, televangelist meetings where you, know, you get up and say, I see it now. I am a corporate <laughs> finance devotee. <laughs> I want that to happen. It might not, but I'm going to try. I want you to have fun because corporate finance is full of puzzles. And you're going to see that if you start to get the principles, the puzzles start to have answers. You open up the newspaper. You're no longer reading a collection of news stories. You're reading a news story and saying, okay, now I see why GE is trying to do what it is, why the market now I see why Apple reported lower sales and its market price went up 6%. I want you to be able to untangle those puzzles around us. And that's fun because you're going to be able to see our answers to questions that you say, hey, I don't know what the answer is. So here's my first task. You all have finished your accounting core class, right? Here's my first task, is to get you out of the accounting mindset. I want you to stop thinking like accountants. How many of you are accountants here? 
I'm going to pick on pretty much every group and say bad things about them. No accountants in this room? No accounting undergraduates? Do we have an accounting undergraduate? There's one person I feel really bad about dumping on you, but I will anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Let's start by thinking how accountants think about the world. And accountants are very fond of balance sheets. They think balance sheets actually matter. And if you look at an accounting balance sheet, which is what you see in any annual report, 10K, let's see what it looks like. On the asset side of the balance sheet, you have long-lived physical assets, land, building, equipment, machinery, right? fixed assets. You have short-lived assets, accounts receivable, cash, inventory, current assets. You might have investments in other companies which are financial assets. You've got fixed assets, you've got current assets, you've got financial assets, and then you have intangible assets. Let's not think like accountants. Are account intangible assets a big part of a company's value? Now let's take a look. What's Coca-Cola's biggest asset? Definitely can't be its bottling plants, right? Why? Because 38 years ago, you know what Coca-Cola did? It actually spun off its bottling plant. So when you buy Coca-Cola, you're not getting any of the physical plants that make Coca-Cola. So you're obviously not buying the plant, the equipment. So what are you buying? What's its biggest asset? Brand name. I'm glad you didn't say taste. Because Coca-Cola doesn't even taste the same around the world. And for a brief period in the 1980s, Coca-Cola actually thought taste mattered. Remember that terrible episode where they tried new Coke and new new Coke, and they said, oh my god, let's go back to old Coke. <laughs> Nobody cares about the taste anyway, right? This has nothing to do with taste. It's brand name. So the biggest asset for Coca-Cola is its brand name. In fact, in my valuation class, I value Coca-Cola's brand name. 80% of its value comes from its brand name. Because the rest of it is just crap and sugar and color in water and carbonate it and sell it off. I mean, let's face it, this isn't rocket science. It's brand name. Biggest asset is brand name. What's Apple's biggest asset? It's coolness factor, operating system. Remember, again, none of these are physical assets, right? My point is, around the world, let's face it, the values of companies are coming from things, assets you cannot see. Right? Accountants are trying to bring them onto the balance sheet. I wish they were. Around the world, when you look at intangible assets, at least as defined by accountants, 85% of all intangible assets around the world take the form of one item. What is that item? What's the most common intangible asset you see on a balance sheet? Goodwill. The most horrific and destructive asset ever created in the history of accounting. That sounds like a terrible thing to say, right? Let me back it up. For goodwill to manifest itself on an accounting balance sheet, what does a company have to do? Acquire another company. So let's back up. If you have the greatest company on the face of the earth and it has grown entirely with internal investments, how much goodwill will you see on its balance sheet? Zero. Take a look at Apple's balance sheet. There's almost no goodwill. Why? Apple has never done a large acquisition in its life. Its biggest acquisition might have been Beats, which cost what? Four billion. For a company, 250 billion cash. That's like petty cash. Oh, four billion disappeared? Who took it? Oh, you bought a company. OK. <laughs> right? You know what? If you look at IBM's balance sheet, this year, you're going to see a lot of goodwill. Why? Because they bought Red Hat. So the minute you do an acquisition, goodwill pops up. Let's take this to the next step. I don't want to put, you know, I'll put, pick on somebody else. Because you've all taken the accounting class. You, anybody can answer this question. And you can step in and correct them if they're wrong. How do accountants measure goodwill? What is it the difference between? The price you paid, so everybody agrees that the, and the, let's see how, oh, you can have that. I wish you hadn't used that word. Because that means the accounting brainwashing actually worked on you. 
It's the difference between what you paid and book value dressed up. This is a process called purchase price allocation. And here's how it works. You do an acquisition, and then you hire an accounting firm, and they send a dozen accountants, and they do war dances around the company for about six months, and they dress up the book value. Basically, they finesse the book value. They say, after the last six months and careful review, we've decided your four billion book value is really 4.1 billion. So if you pay 10 billion for a company, and the book value is 4 billion, the dressed up book value, the accountant has a $6 billion problem to explain away, right? Why? Because until yesterday, what was the accountant saying? It's worth $4 billion. Oops, it's worth $10 billion. So what does he do? He takes the $6 billion, and he puts it on the balance sheet and calls it goodwill. And why does he need to do it? Because balance sheets have this very unpleasant requirement, which is they have to balance. Goodwill exists for one reason and one reason alone, which is if you didn't have it, balance sheet wouldn't balance. You know what the problem with goodwill does? It sounds good. And when something sounds good, people feel the urge to pay for it. You'd be surprised how many emails I get every week from people valuing companies saying, I'm valuing this company. It has $6 billion in goodwill. How much should I pay for goodwill? You feel like slapping the person around the face and wake up. It's a plug variable. What the heck are you doing paying for a plug variable? Every year, I send these suggestions to the accounting rule writers. They never seem to take my suggestions. <laughs> so about eight years ago, I sent a suggestion. I said, let's re in, in algebra, when you have two numbers that don't equate, to, if you want to write an equation to make them look equal, what do you do? 2 plus x is 5. You put in an x any time you have a missing variable, right? I said, let's rename Goodwill. Let's call it x. You imagine opening up a balance sheet, it says x is 6 billion. You would never feel the urge to pay for x, right? But that is closer to reality than calling it Goodwill and giving it this patina of something behind it. That's how accountants balance balance sheets. And on the other side of the balance sheet, you have current liabilities, accounts payable, supplier credit, deferred this, deferred that, deferred everything under the sun. <laughs> then you've got bank loans and corporate bonds, long-term liabilities. Then you've got these liabilities that you don't even know what they are. They have accounting rule numbers attached to them. Fast this, five billion. What is fast this? I have no idea. And then you have shareholders' equity. Sounds glorious, right? So let's open up Coca-Cola's balance sheet and look at the shareholder's equity number on the balance sheet. What does it reflect? What goes into it? So and think like an accountant now. It, what is it? Paid in capital, which happened when for Coca-Cola? When they did their IPO, which was 100 years ago, plus, plus additional, let's keep going, because that'll still get you like 10 million or 15 million. Plus a summation, if I wrote it out in algebra terms, it's a summation of your retained earnings over your history, plus your paid in capital, minus the buybacks you might have done over time. But the lo to cut a long story short, it's the ultimate backward looking number, right? So the longer you've been around, the more substance is going to be shareholders equity. If I gave you Airbnb, and then looked at the balance sheet, how much shareholders equity am I going to see? Almost nothing. You write the history of the Roman Empire, it can go thousands and thousands of pages. You write the history of the Slovenian Empire, my wife is half Slovenian, it'll be what, seven pages long? The Slovenian Empire has been around 17 years before that, it was part of the Austrian Empire, part of the Ottoman Empire, it's, it's never been a country until 17 years ago. So young companies, the shareholders' equity will be non-existent. Doesn't mean the company's worth nothing, it just means the accountants haven't written much history. First thing to remember about accountants is they're historians. Sometimes they forget their role. They try to be forecasters. They should. They're historians. Somebody's got to do the dirty work. They record the past. Second, accountants love to write rules. Have you noticed this? When in doubt, write a rule. If you don't believe me, pick up gap. You'll almost fall over. It's like 15,000 pages long. 
pick up IFRS. This is not just an American disease. It seems to be global. Accountants <laughs> like to write rules. So if you're an accountant, it's all about following the rules and reflecting the past, which is fine. As I said, somebody's got to do that dirty work. I don't want to. So from this point on, I want you to take your accounting hat on, if you ever put it on. Take it off now. Because I'm going to put a financial hat on you. And I'm going to reframe the balance sheet. This is the way I see companies. And this is the way we're going to see companies for the next 15 weeks. When I look at a company, I don't care whether your assets are physical or intangible, fixed assets or current assets. I'm going to divide your assets into assets in place, investments you've already made as a company, and growth assets. So what are growth assets? This is the value that I attach to investments I expect you to make in the future. How far into the future? As far as the eye can see. You think, why would you do that? When you buy stock in NVIDIA, or Airbnb when it goes public, or Uber when it goes public, remember the bulk of your value comes from what? Not from things they've already done, but things that you expect them to do in the future. In accounting, it's going to be almost impossible to bring that onto the balance sheet. I don't think, even think accountants should try. But in finance, we're unconstrained. I can say the bulk, or almost all of your value comes from investments I expect you to make in the future. So I'm going to divide companies up into investments you've already made and investments I expect you to make in the future. And ultimately, there are only two ways you can fund a business. You can borrow the money or use your own money. You can dance around these two ways as much as you want. We can call one debt and the other equity. We can call them bonds and stock. But ultimately, small or large, all businesses, there are only two ways you can raise money. You can either borrow the money or use your own money, debt and equity. This financial balance sheet is going to come up and come back again and again in this class because it's going to give us a structure of thinking about companies and thinking about what they should be focusing on. So I said this class is the most critical one of the entire semester. So I'm going to lay out the broad themes for this class. First, let me show you the big picture. I, I promise you the big picture. Here is the big picture of corporate finance. If you get this page, the rest of the class can be skipped. So I'm going to summarize this entire class into this page. There are three broad sets of decisions that every business has to make. The first are investment decisions. What projects you take, what assets you invest in. And here's the principle that's going to govern how we think about whether you should make that investment decision. If the return you can make on an asset exceeds a minimum acceptable hurdle rate, you should invest in an asset. Already have thrown a buzzword in there, right? Minimum acceptable hurdle rate. You're saying, what the heck is that? I'm not quite ready to give you specifics, but here's the principle that's going to govern how we come up with hurdle rates, what you need to make. The hurdle rate should be higher for riskier investments than for safer investments. Does it make sense to you? If I came to you with an investment with guaranteed cash flows, you might say I'll settle for 5%. But if this is an investment with a lot of uncertainty, you should demand more, not because you're greedy, but because you're prudent. So the hurdle rate should reflect the risk of the investment you're taking and should also reflect where you raise funds. Remember, there are two ways of raising funds, debt and equity. That mix should also affect the hurdle rate. So hurdle rates for investment should reflect the risk of the investment and the mix of debt and equity used to fund that investment. So that gives you half of the investment principle. That gives you the hurdle rate. You say, what do you mean by returns? I'll give you the sub-principle again that's going to govern how we think about returns. When we talk about returns on projects in finance, those returns should be based on cash flows. Cash in, cash out. As opposed to what? as opposed to accounting earnings and profits. I have to justify that, because you've spent a lot of time coming up with the proverbial bottom line in accounting. I'm saying, throw it out. I don't care. It's cash in, cash out. It should be based on cash flows. It should reflect when you get those cash flows. And don't make this more complicated than it has to be. Would you rather get a cash flow today or wait a year to get it? I said, don't think too long. Okay. This is somehow a principle we, we know when we're four years old, we tend to forget when we get to be 25. With all of my kids, there's a simple test I put them through very early in life to decide how much I should set aside 
for college in the future. <laughs> so at four, I would ask them, they'd have an, a weekly allowance, and I'd ask them the, the, the key quest, this is going to determine the entire future. I said, Brian or Kieran or Brendan or Kendra, my four kids, would you rather get the allow your allowance on Saturday or would you prefer to get it on Monday? Start of the week or the end of the week? And usually I do this before the week kicked in because that would be a tricky way to do it. Just do it on a Tuesday and see if they can think it through. But at four, you've got to cut them some slack. <laughs> Thank God none of them said, Dad, I'd rather wait till Saturday. My youngest I knew I had to be careful with because he said, Dad, is it the same allowance? <laughs> so I had to double the money I put into his college fund just in case. Okay? <laughs> what I'm saying is this time value of money concept, we know when we're four years old. And if you live in Latin America, you are born with this impulse. Because all you need is some high inflation to teach you that you can I mean, can you imagine in Venezuela putting in 5,000 bolivar into your pocket, forgetting about it for 15 minutes? You can't even probably use it as toilet paper. Eh? Inflation teaches you about that. But if you lived in Europe or the US, low interest rates, you get sloppy and lazy and say, why is that again? That a cash flow in year one is worth more than a cash flow in year 10. And then you draw in difference curves. With the, you don't need any of that stuff. So when we talk about returns, not only should it be based on cash flow, it should reflect when you get those cash flows, the timing of those cash flows. And third, it should have all side costs and benefits built into it. I'm going to use a term that I will come back to again and again. There's no garnishing allowed in investment analysis. You know what I mean by garnishing? If many of you worked at businesses, and many of you have probably sat in on these project analyses and the numbers come in, and the numbers don't look good. So everything about the number says, don't take the project. And somebody then pipes up. But there are strategic considerations. <laughs> There's synergy. There's, those are the garnishing, words you throw into the mix because you want to take the project so much that you want the numbers to get thrown out. In this class, we're going to hold strategists' feet to the fire. You want to talk about strategic stuff? Let's get real. What's strategic about it? Where do I show it in the cash flows? You want to talk about synergy? Let's get real. What are the synergies? My job is to bring in whatever you want to talk about into the numbers, because if I let this stay outside the numbers, there's no point to investment analysis. You're going to take whatever project you felt like taking. I call these words that come up after a project has been described weapons of mass distraction. Because that's what they are. They want to distract you from the numbers. They say, look at this shiny object here. And we've talked about strategic, one of the most dangerous words in business. Because you know what strategic means. The numbers don't fly, but I really, really want to do this. <laughs> What's a strategic deal? It's a bad deal that you really want to do. A strategic buyer is just another word for a stupid buyer. <laughs> he makes up his mind to buy a company before he comes to the bargaining table. Who does that? Strategic. In fact, I wrote a blog. This is the kind of thing that I waste my time writing posts about. I wrote about the classic weapons of mass distraction, strategic, synergy, brand name. And then come the two Trump words. I use the word Trump, but the, uh, no, I'm not talking political. I'm talking about Trump in the old sense of the key words. Let me take the word Trump out. These are words you use when you really have a really bad deal and you want to do it. You know the first word is? China. Try that. <laughs> you notice this? Really bad project, nobody's buying the numbers. Say China. It's amazing, extra zeros will start popping up. For 15 years in business, China has been the word that companies use when they want to evade any kind of, you know, we're in China. We lost billions, but we're in China. Okay. I'll go to China with you. You know what, though? The problem with weapons of mass distraction is they can very quickly turn against you. 
Until a year ago, two years ago, China was a word that added zeros. Have you noticed for the last year now, China has now become the word that gets used against companies? Because I'm not arguing that strategic synergy, control, brand name, China, whatever weapons of mass distraction you want to use, don't have value. But if you want to talk about them, my job is to bring them into the numbers. So let me review. When you look at a project, you want to get a return that reflects cash flows, reflects when the cash flows come in, and has all side effects built into it. And when you talk about a hurdle rate, the hurdle rate should reflect how risky an investment is and where you get the funds for the investment. In general principles, I mean, I haven't defined risk, I haven't talked about how I bring it, but that's why we have 14 weeks left in the class. But that's the sub-principle we're gonna to go towards. Let's move to the second big principle in business. I said there were two ways to fund a business. You can borrow the money, you use your own money. Which is better? It depends. For some companies, you shouldn't borrow money. The right mix for you is all equity, and it's not magic. If you're a company that's losing a lot of money and you have very little revenues, how much should you borrow? This is a trick question, but go ahead with me. If you're Lime, you know what Lime does, right? They leave these scooters all over the sidewalk so people can trip and fall and kill themselves. I live in San Diego. I have to constantly be aware of scooters and bikes and stuff left on the road. If you're Lime, I read yesterday that somebody's attached a $2 billion value to a company that hasn't even figured out how to make money. How much can Lime borrow? It shouldn't be because it can't afford to borrow money. So the right mix for them might be 100% equity. But if you're Procter & Gamble, mature company, maybe you should borrow more. So let's talk about the financing principle. The financing principle says find the right mix of debt and equity for you as a business. There's no one mix for everybody. And if you ask me what type of debt should I use? You know what I mean by what type of debt? Long term or short term? Dollar debt or euro debt? Floating rate or fixed rate? I'm going to turn the question back on you and say, tell me what kind of projects you have, what kind of assets you have. If your assets are long term, your debt should be long term. If your assets are off cash flows in euros, your debt should be in? This isn't rocket science. You say, I need 15 weeks for this class. It seems pretty straightforward. You don't actually. It could be done after today. The financing principle says find the right mix of debt and equity for your company. The mix that maximizes your value as a business or minimizes your hurdle rate, the two are equivalent statements, and match the debt up to your assets. And there's a third principle. And sometimes people forget this principle because it's viewed almost as a failure. Why do farmers plant crops? Go along with me. You're saying this is an agriculture class now. Let's go along. Why do, do they, it's because they want the glory of watching their plants grow? It's because they ultimately want to do what? They want to harvest the crop, right? Why do we invest in companies? We like the fact that these companies grow. That's great. But eventually, what do we want to get from these companies? We want to be able to harvest the cash flows. That is the dividend principle. And here's what it says. If you cannot find investments that make your hurdle rate, you say, that'll never happen. This class, you're going to see some very depressing statistics about companies around the world. I'll give you a preview. 60% of all companies globally last year collectively earned returns less than their hurdle rate. They have a tough time finding projects that don't make their hurdle rate. If you cannot find projects that make your hurdle rate, what should you do? Take the cash out of the business. If this is a private business, I'm saying, please, 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 Take the money out of the business. If it's a publicly traded company, it gets a little messier, right? Because to return cash to the owners, you have one of two ways. Until about 40 years ago, it only one way, which was pay dividends. In the last 30 years, and we're going to see the trend lines of this, what's the other way companies have returned cash? The stock buyback. Last year, for every dollar return in dividends, there were $2 return in buybacks. And of course, there's this hysteria about buybacks. So terrible the companies are buying back stock. So what can they do? What should they be doing instead? No, not even dividends. I wish it were dividends. That would be a sensible thing. They should be investing back in the business. Do you really want G putting your money, remember it's your money, back into their businesses today? 
what, is it, what, is it, what have they been able to do every time they've tried to invest in their business for the last 10, 15, 20 years? Just destroy your value. If you cannot find investments that meet your hurdle rate, give the cash back to the stockholders. Does it mean that cash is not being invested? What are the stockholders? Last year, 600, actually $800 billion was returned in the form of buybacks. Where do you think that money went? It went into other stocks predominantly. Some people might have spent it on their cars. How dare they? Or expanding their houses. How dare they? But most of that cash went into other companies. What kinds of companies? Companies that needed the capital that were raising more capital. So basically, when you buy back, the money doesn't leave the system. It gets invested by some, somewhere else. That is the great blind spot that people don't want to deal with when they talk about buybacks. They think about buybacks as, that's money leaving the system. That's terrible, isn't it? No, that's not terrible, because that money is finding its way into other companies in the system of a better use for your money. In fact, I think it's terrible. When you have companies that don't have investments, keep the money and put money back in. That's Europe right now. Because in Europe, because buybacks are forbidden in many parts of Europe, Many mature companies that don't have projects are taking the money and doing exactly what the buyback opponents want them to do, put it back into the business. And in the process, Europe is growing at 10% a year, right? That's you know, actually it's you know, having trouble getting above zero. But one of the reasons is because the capital cannot leave companies without investments and get to companies where those investments are available. So the dividend principle is a very simple one. If you cannot find investments that earn your hurdle rate, give the cash back to the owners of the business. Whether you do it in the form of dividends or buybacks will depend on what your owners prefer. And we'll talk about why some people prefer to get dividends and other people prefer buybacks, but they're both ways of returning cash to the owners. And in doing all of this, you have a singular objective. Your objective in corporate finance is to make your business the most valuable business you can. So you ready? I'm going to lay out the themes. First, is there anything I've said so far something that surprised you? <laughs> Think of what I've said. If you can raise money at 9% rather than 10%, please raise it at 9%. Does that surprise you? No, OK. Once you raise it at 9%, I'm saying please don't take projects that make less than 9%. You know, if you're surprised by that, then we have a math problem, not a corporate finance problem. And I said, if you can't find those investments, give the cash back. Nothing I've said is revolutionary or something that should surprise you. And that's going to be a theme I've come back to over and over in this class. Corporate finance is built around common sense, which is part of the reason you can be a great business person who's never taken Forget a corporate finance, you've never gone to school. One of India's largest companies, Reliance, was built by a guy called Dhirubhai Ambani, who was a fifth grade dropout. Incredible business person. You know why? Because he got those first principles in corporate finance. He didn't sit there saying, oh, should I take those projects that makes 5%, looks good? Should I let strategic considerations drive this choice? Good business people through the ages have always understood these principles. How long have people been running businesses? I'm sure there were some very good cave business people. <laughs> Tools for sale, you know. Through the ages, good business people have always got these principles. And conversely, there are people with MBAs and PhDs out there who think the first principles don't apply to them. Why? Because they're special. They went to Harvard and they work at Goldman. So therefore, the first principles don't apply to me. This class is going to be a constant reminder that the first principles apply to all of us. You can evade them, you can escape them for a short period, but sooner or later, if you violate them, they catch up with you. So what I'm trying to say is during the course of this class, when we go through something and it doesn't make sense to you, stop and try to clear it up. Don't say, well, if that's what corporate finance says, it must be right. Don't let it pass by. Pass everything we make sure that those conclusions we're drawing about how to run businesses pass the common sense test. Second, corporate finance is focus. You know where the focus comes from? What did I say the objective in corporate finance was? Maximize the value of the business. We have a singular objective. 
Everything we do in corporate finance, I'm going to pass through that objective. So when I ask, what's the right way to decide the mix of debt and equity? The way I'm going to answer is, I'm going to find the mix of debt and equity that maximizes my value as a business. What's the best project to take? Again, I'm going to go. So by having a singular objective, I'm going to get focus. That's a good side. You know what the bad side is? If you don't agree with that objective, nothing we do in this class is going to make sense. If you believe the objective of company should be to maximize social welfare, or corporate sustainability, I don't even know what that means, but I'll throw that out there, corporate sustainability, which I think is the stupidest objective you can have. It's like saying, I want to be a mummy. <laughs> a corporation is a legal entity. The reason for your existence is gone. Why the heck would I want you to sustain yourself? But that's for a different class. But if you say your objective is different than maximum, then we're going to have differences. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do something very perverse. For the next two sessions, I'm going to take the objective in corporate finance, which is maximizing value, and I'm going to inoculate you. You know how? I'm going to take every weak link in it, and I'm going to go to the extreme and say, these are all the terrible things that can happen when you maximize value. And you're going to say, what the hell is he doing? He's undercutting his own class. And then I'm going to say, OK, what are you going to use instead? Then I'm going to ask you to pass whatever objective you have through the same kind of rigid test that I will pass maximized value to. And if you can find a better objective, all the more power to you. So I'm not going to try to sell you on this objective. I'm going to give you why I think in a world of imperfect objectives, this is the objective I'm going to latch on to. So we're going to spend time on the objective. And it's going to sound like a waste of discussion. For those of you who want to get to risk-free rates and betas and risk premiums and cost of capital, you've got to wait. Because none of that stuff matters if you disagree with me on this, the ultimate objective of what you should. And this is an objective that's out there now being, it's front and center, right? What is the end game for a corporation? And we're going to talk about how you bring in social responsibility into this objective function. We're going to talk about the difference between objectives and constraints. And how mixing the two up can lead to some very strange decisions. And I'm going to sound like a moral pygmy when I talk about some of this stuff. And you know, in a sense, you're going to say, that sounds so amoral or unethical. But I'm going to kind of lay out why I think, even in a world where you have to worry about corporate social, why you still need a singular objective. I'm going to use a bunch of structures in this class to kind of nail topics down. One of them is, of course, the financial balance sheet you saw. Here's the other one. I'm a great believer that companies like people go through a life cycle. You know how the human life cycle begins, right? It starts as an infant. You then become a teenager. What do teenagers do? Really stupid things. And then you become in the prime of your life. The prime of your life, you can go to sleep at 3 and wake up at 6 and still feel whole. <laughs> and then you notice there's a day when that no longer is true. You pass the prime of your life. You become middle-aged. And before you start complaining about middle age, there are worse things waiting for you. You get old, and then you get older. My daughter tells my, my father, you know, he's, he's 91. She said, how old are you? And he said, I'm 91. He said, you're oldest old. She had this class where they had old, old, oldest old, or no, young old. He's oldest old. So one day you'll be oldest old, and finally, like all human beings, you will die. What a morbid thought, right? But companies go through their own version of the life cycle. What's a startup? It's an infant. Unlike human beings, though, at least in much of the developed world, the mortality rate among corporate babies is very high. Two thirds of corporate startups, what happens to them? They die. You say, how terrible, but that's you know, it is what it is. If you make it through, and you become a teenager. What do we say teenagers do? They have a lot of promise, but they do incredibly stupid things. I have a 19-year-old, so I know. There are teenage companies. So if you're wondering, why does Tesla do some of the things it does? Cut it some slack. It's like a 19-year-old. It's going to do some really stupid things. It has a lot of potential. But you kind of, kind of, then you become the prime of your life. 
the Googles and the Facebooks in 2018. I'm attaching a time to this because you can see how quickly you can go from the prime of your life to past your prime. Everything works out. People think you're, you know, you can get away with everything. And then you start to get old. And you notice it. And what do human beings start to do when they start to get old? They want to try to be young again. They find plastic surgeons. I watched the show Botched. Have you watched this incredible show? Now watch it if you can. <laughs> About what happens to human beings who, as they get old, want to be young again. Terrible things. Companies do the same thing. As they get old, they try to be young again. And their version of plastic surgeons is investment banks and consultants. And we'll make you young again. <laughs> we have the magic bullet. And let's face it. The if you think about the mother's milk for investment banking consulting, it's companies that don't want to act their age. But who can blame them? But eventually, even they realize. In fact, when Walmart bought Flipkart, I called it the most expensive facelift in history. <laughs> the only problem with facelifts is eventually gravity works its magic again. And you can do only so many facelifts before you become Joan Rivers. If you've never seen Joan Rivers, you have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> Pull it up on Google, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Your face gets frozen. You can't move a muscle. No. But eventually you get to a point of age. And the reason I like this corporate life cycle, it makes corporate finance very simple. Let's play a game. You guys are going to be lying. Young company, lots of potential, huge promise, but nothing to show in terms of you guys can be, let's pick a nice middle-aged company, Apple. The most you know, prolific cash machine in history, but growth, there's no growth here. It's basically a low-growth cash machine. And you guys, I'm sorry to do this to you, are going to be GE. <laughs> in terms of the corporate life cycle, infant, or just past the infancy tail, you made it through the, the mortality rate, but you're very young, middle-aged, old. Which company would you rather manage before we go any further? Do you want to be a GE manager, an Apple manager? It's going to be a lot more exciting at Lime, right? Every day is going to, might be your last day. <laughs> but no, it's, it's, you know, the future is boundless in both directions. Let's do Corporate Finance 101. I said there were three principles, right? The investment principle, the financing principle, and the dividend principle. Which of those principles are you going to be most focused on? It has to be investments because your future lies in taking the best projects, getting growth. How much debt should you take on? We dealt with this already. Why? When you borrow money, you've got to make those unpleasant interest expenses, right? Try paying interest with potential. Walk in the bank and say, look, I know I owe you 8%, but can I pay with potential instead? It doesn't work. So you shouldn't borrow money. And how much should you pay in dividends? What dividends? So capital structure and dividend policy, basically why? It's all about investment policy. Let's move in here. You are a mature company. You got cash cows delivering value, like the iPhone. Your investment you know, decisions are going to be, hey, let's maintain this cash cow. Let's not kill it. You have a lot of cash to work with. But you can already see that the focus in the company now starts to shift towards capital structure decisions, because maybe you can lower your cost of capital by half a percent. Maybe you could do, but you can see how the shift occurs, because you can now afford to borrow money. And can you afford to return some cash to your stockholders? Don't think too long. If you have 245 billion in cash, yes, you can return some cash to your stockholders. The focus has shifted from the investment principle more towards capital structure and dividend policy. And if you're GE, should you be optimizing your capital structure? I, I hope that's not what's for you, it's a question of death coming, and how do I make this the most pleasant experience, if it can be? Because there's no end game here. This is a story, not, this isn't a fairy tale. There's no happy ending for every company. For GE, the focus is going to be on the dividend principle and kind of getting out of the businesses there and returning the cash to the stockholders. But you can already see how the focus shifts as you go across the life cycle. 
I'm going to use the corporate life cycle with each of my principles. Say, hey, you tell me where you're in the life cycle. I'll tell you what you should be focusing on, how much debt you should have. It's a very simplistic way of doing corporate finance, but it's a very effective way. The most unfortunate part of this class is its name. What is it called? Corporate finance. When it says corporate, what are you thinking? That it has to be finance as applied to corporations. Nothing could be further from the truth. This is a business finance class. It's not a corporate finance class. In what sense? Do you think that hot dog stand guy outside, I mean, he's been out there for 25 years, I think. No, I've seen him. Do you think he has to make some investment decisions? Like adding sausage to the menu is an investment decision. I still remember you used to have a cart where he stood outside and about 10, year, 10 years ago he got a cart where he could stand inside and cook. Huge plus in the winter. And I, when I first got it, I said, this is much better, you know, this will cost you a lot of money. He said, no, I gave $50,000. He said, where did you get the money? He said, I borrowed 30000 from the bank. I said, did you optimize your debt ratio? <laughs> I didn't ask him that question, but in a sense, he took the money because that's what he, so the cap, he had to make a financing decision, debt and equity. Do you think he has to make dividend decisions? You know, he has two kids who go to college, and he's got to pay college tuition. Where does he get the tuition money? From cash flows from the business. He's making investment decisions, for, but they're, you're saying they're so small. R really? I think the decisions he makes have far more consequences than the decision that IBM makes, because IBM makes a bad decision. It can go to capital markets. It might be too big to fail. I mean, there are all these fail-safe mechanisms. He makes a bad decision. He goes, not just out of business, he goes bankrupt. Every business, small or large, has to make these decisions, and the principles remain the same. I know, how many of you are from emerging, I know this is a kind of a loaded word. How many of you are from Latin America or Asia? I remember when I first started teaching this class, the emerging market people said, this is all US stuff. And who can blame you? Because all your cases come from Harvard, and I've never used a Harvard case study. And they're all about US companies or European companies. I think, I think this is corporate finance for developed market companies. But in emerging markets, you have all these constraints, information disclosure laws. It must be different. I'm not going to let you get away with that. Emerging market companies have to make the same decisions that you might have to make them with different constraints. But corporate finance is universal. It applies to all businesses, small or large, private or public, developed or emerging markets. Earlier I talked about corporate finance being common sense and how some people think the first principles don't apply to them and therefore they can get away with whatever they want to do. I said this class is going to be a reminder that we cannot violate first principles no matter who we are. So we're going to take news stories about a company doing something because KKR tells them they should do it. And we say, is that the right thing to do? Because you can't assume that just because KKR tells a company to do it that it's the right thing. Or Goldman Sachs says, or McKinsey. Because people violate first principles for all kinds of reasons. So I'll tell you a story about what happens when first principles get violated. Have you heard of a company called Steady Safe? I'm not surprised. It was an Indonesian taxi cab company in the early 1990s. The early 1990s, Indonesia was going through a growth boom. So SteadySafe decides it wants to expand, which means buying more taxi cabs, putting them on the ground. It's a public company. And it decided that it wanted to borrow the money to buy the taxi cab. So you're going to be my investment banker, and I'm steady safe. Remember, I'm an Indonesian taxi cab company, and I want to expand in Indonesia. I come to you, and I ask you questions about the type of debt I should take. So let's start easy. How long term should my debt be? You're allowed to ask me that questions. What do we say the financial principle was? How long? So basically, what am I going to buy with this debt? Taxi cabs. The question you'd ask me is, how long do your taxi cabs last? About 10 years before they run into the ground. Okay, so your debt should be about 10 year debt. In what currency should the debt be? You're saying, what the heck is the Indonesian currency? Let me help you out, it's the rupiah. 
Indonesian rupiah. Why? Because when I take a taxi cab in Indonesia and I get out, I pay in rupiah. I don't pay in dollars, I don't pay in euros, I pay in rupiah. So that was easy, right? Ten year, rupiah debt. So let's play out what actually happened. Steady Safe went to an investment bank called Peregrine, at that time one of the leading Southeast Asian investment banks, and they asked this question, what type of debt should we take? And Peregrine said, 10-year debt, so they got that half of the equation right, but they said US dollar debt. And they gave a reason that sounded compelling. You know what the reason was? The interest rate on US dollar debt is much lower than the interest rate in rupiah debt, so it's cheaper borrow in dollars. We'll talk about the absurdity of that comparison in a minute. But just, you know, in the face of it, 12% versus, is 12 lower than 19? Come on, go along. Yes, <laughs> it looks cheaper. To give steady safe credit, they ask Peregrine, should we be worried about the fact that we're borrowing in dollars and funding all these rupiah assets? And Peregrine said, don't worry about it. The Indonesian government has pegged the exchange rate and has promised us that nothing bad will happen. <laughs> you know what peg the exchange rate means, right? They fix the exchange rate, nothing bad will happen. So Steady Safe said, you're the investment bank, you must know what you're doing. Terrible thing to say, but you know, they said that. And went out and borrowed 10 million US dollars and borrowed the money, bought the cars, put them on the ground. For a couple of years, things went swimmingly well. Until 1996, when the Indonesian government that had promised that nothing bad would happen decided to do what? Devalue the currency by 70%. So let's wake up to the morning after at steady safe. Your assets are all rupiah assets, right? In dollar terms, they're now worth 30% of what they were yesterday. Now, if all your debt had been rupiah debt, that would have also been marked down 70%. You might not have been happy about what happened, but you wouldn't have been in trouble. But since the debt was all in US dollars, they still owed exactly what they did the previous day, so guess what happened to Steady Safe? They went bankrupt. The only good thing that came out of this is they took their investment banker down with them. <laughs> if you ask me, it happens far too infrequently. Investment bankers are always there at the wedding. They're never there at the divorce. Actually, let me take that back. The wedding planners and divorce lawyers rolled into one. Different parts of the bank will take care of you either way. <laughs> See, why did they do it? Because their incentives are not the same. It's not because they're bad people. It's because their incentives are different than yours. I've told people, to ask an investment banker whether a deal makes sense is like asking a plastic surgeon whether there's something wrong with your face. <laughs> What's the answer you're going to get? You're already perfect. You don't need any surgery. Time after time, we see markets, investors, companies ignoring first principles. And time after time, what do we see? We see a correction where eventually the truth hits it. Saying an example, let's suppose you take a thousand people who've had credit problems in the past. They've had trouble paying their debt. You put them in a room. You decide to lend them all money. You run a model that says they will never default in the future. And you lend them money at a really low rate. Do you think there's going to be a problem here? That, in a nutshell, is the subprime crisis in 2000. The 2008 crisis was not that people lent money to people who were bad credits. They lent money and did not charge a high enough interest rate. You forget first principles. Sooner or later, we catch up with you. In fact, you know how investment banks, staying on the theme of investment banks, and beating them up a little bit more, how they run these tombstone ads? You know how they show you, look at the deals we did, big deal, bigger deal, huge deal, hugest deal, and all of the deals, your names on the, the deal. I've considered raising money and running ads for investment banks, but my ads will look a little different. For Morgan Stanley, for instance, here's what the tombstone page will look like. Advisor to Quaker Oats on the acquisition of Snapple in 1992 for $2 billion. Right next to it, just to be cruel, Advisor to Quaker Oats and the divestiture of Snapple in 1995 for $300 million. 
Now, you don't need to do any internal rate of return calculations. You know, if you pay $2 billion in 92 and you get back $300 million in 95, that this was one screwed up deal. But the scary thing is, Morgan Stanley got advisory fees on both ends of that deal. For what? You could have just asked your doorman in your building, how much should I pay for the Snapple company? He takes a swig and says, tastes really good, pay $2 billion. But it's not the banker's fault. It's your fault. It's your money. It's your obligation as the CFO of the company to say, does this deal make sense for my stockholders? So let's talk about the pragmatic stuff again. The material for the class, the lecture notes are the key thing you need. That's the absolute necessity. If you want to buy a book and you want to throw your money away, there's this obscenely overpriced book of mine. In fact, I'll tell you how obscenely overpriced it is. It's called, it's called Applied Corporate Finance. It's right after I finished the book. They offered to sell me 10 copies of the book, not send it free, to sell me. So I said, you know, it's good to have 10 copies to hand out to people. So I, 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 I say, OK, put the 10 copies there. That'll be 100 and, actually, they said, uh, that would be $140 a piece or $1,400. I said, what? You want me to pay $140 for a paperback? I don't want it. So if you want to pay the money and buy the book, you know, I think it's, it's one of my favorite books, but I wouldn't pay $140 for it. <laughs> so I'm going to undercut my publisher, as I will repeatedly in this class. There's an Asian edition of the book, which is much cheaper. So we have friends who live in India. I'm probably breaking every rule in my contract, but what's the worst they can do? They can withhold my royalties. But, you know, it doesn't matter that much anyway. So, if you want to buy the book, you're welcome to, but it's not required. Right? There are practice problems on the web page for the class, and all my spreadsheets and data are you know, on the web page as well. So as we go through, those will be the things I will use in class, and you can draw on that. I've actually, uh, rather than do a traditional syllabus, I said everything in this class is going to be built around the big picture. You're going to see this page about 30 times over the course of the next 26 sessions. Because every time I introduce a topic, I'm going to put it in the context of the big picture. So I'm saying, this is why we're talking about this for the next two sessions. This is the part of the big picture. So everything is going to be latched on to the big picture. So we're going to start with the principles of the class, the objective. And then we're going to build through the investment principle, which will take us through session 15. And the financing principle will take us to session 20. And the dividend principles take us to session 23. And then we go back to talking about valuation, the bookend of this class. And say, if it's all about maximizing value, let's talk about how to value a company. Kind of a lead in into my valuation class if you want to take it, but enough as a standalone that you should be able to value a company by the end of this class. But that's not the end game. This is about running businesses and running them well, not about valuation. And I told you this class is going to be applied, and I mean it. I'm sick and tired of XYZ widget companies. I don't even know why we talk about widgets when you have 41,000 or 43,000 publicly traded companies out there doing real things. So everything in this class is going to be applied in real companies. And there are going to be six companies that run through the entire class. The first company I'm going to use is Disney. You know why I picked Disney? Everybody in this room knows what Disney does or thinks they know what Disney does. Why do you think I'm wearing my Mickey shirt? If I picked Alcoa, we'd be struggling hard. What the hell does Alcoa do? What is aluminum used for? Disney, we kind of know. So it's a large US entertainment company. Everything I do in this class, I'm going to apply in Disney. So when we talk about hurdle rates, I'm going to come up with hurdle rates for Disney. When we talk about investment returns, I'm going to look at how to analyze a Disney theme park. When we talk about capital structure, I'm going to come up with the right mix of debt and equity for Disney as a company. So we're going to start with Disney. The second company I'm going to use is Vale. The thing about picking real companies is the world doesn't stop when you finish the analysis, right? For those of you who've been reading the stories about Vale, the last two weeks have been horrifically bad, not just for Vale, but for people who've been, one of the dams next to the, one of the mines is kind of broken up. I think hundreds of people have died. You say, why don't you pick a more good news company? You can pick whatever company you want. Things will happen over the course of the semester. That's the nice thing about 
picking real companies. That's it. It's, it's the way the real world works. Might as well live in the real world. We're going to talk about Vale. Why did I pick Vale? To get as different as I could from Disney. Disney is an entertainment company. You can talk about intangible assets. Vale is a mining company. People think it's a Brazilian mining company. It's really not. It's incorporated in Brazil, but it's the largest iron ore mining company in the world. So I want to talk about how corporate finance principles apply for Vale. Everything I do in this class, I'm going to apply in Vale. The third company I'm going to use is Tata Motors, Indian automobile company. Why did I pick Tata Motors? Because it's part of a family group called the Tata Group. And when you're part of a group of companies, the decisions you make might not be in the best interest of the company, and they might be in the best interest of the group. So as we struggle with Tata Motors, that sounds strange. Why would they do that? We might have to step back and think about family group interests. Let's face it. Much of Asian Latin America, you don't have standalone companies. You have companies that are parts of groups, and we have to talk about it. So it allows me to talk about that family group effect. The fourth company I'm going to use is Baidu. What is Baidu? Basically, it's a search engine that only the Chinese use. And they use it because they have no choice. I remember the first time I landed in Shanghai, I was, I was doing a blog, a blog post. I have a Google blog. I was doing a blog post before I took off. I land and I open up my blog post. It's gone. I say, what the hell happened? There is a Google.com, not there. Trillion dollar company, gone while I was up in the air. <laughs> then I had to talk to people and say, no, 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 you have to do this trick and that trick. And so basically, Baidu is a search engine that stepped into the void. It's, it, it, but it's a technology company. It lets me bring China into the equation and talk about what's different about the Chinese technology company. What makes Baidu kind of unique? I know I'm running over here, but I'll run over about three minutes. Is it's the company that is traded. It's not traded on the Shenzhen Exchange, the Shanghai or Hong Kong. You know where it's traded? It's traded in the NASDAQ. And we'll talk about why. Because it's not the only. Alibaba is the same way. And you're actually not buying Baidu, the Chinese search engine company. You're buying a Cayman Islands Shelter, this is getting a little convoluted. Right? We'll talk about why this, but it's going to have consequences. Because you think you have any chance of changing the way Baidu is run, let go of it. Because you can run the shell, the shell company in the Cayman Islands all you want. But there's nothing there. The real company is separated in China. So it will allow us to talk about corporate governance when you've got these entities in the way that are going to kind of make it more difficult. Then I'm going to talk about Deutsche Bank. Why? Because banks are incredibly boring, regulated companies. And you're going to see how constraints kick in the way. Because what do we say for companies? Pick the right mix of debt and equity. Banks can never do that. First, because debt is not a source of capital to a bank. It's raw material. And second, banks have to meet capital ratios. and that's, So we're going to talk about how decisions are constrained in financial service companies. And then I'm going to end with a company called Bookscape. Bookscape is actually an independent bookstore in New York City. I've changed the name of the bookstore. It's a small, privately owned bookstore, and everything I do in this class, I'm going to apply on Bookscape. So you can see how your rules, your principles, your models have, the principles don't change, but the models and the data that you use are going to be different for small private companies. And while we do all of this, you're going to be picking a company, and you're going to be doing this in parallel. So on Wednesday, I'm going to talk about your project, and your project will be you doing this on a company of your choice through the course of the semester. So I'll see you on Wednesday. Hi, how are you? Uh, I wanted to understand what process should I go through while I select a company. Just pick a company you want to. First, you're going to find a, find a group first. Find a group first. It's not an individual project. The group has to pick a common theme. So before you pick a company, you want to find a group. And then the companies within that group can stretch a spectrum. They can be small or large, even private companies. So. Find the group first, and then you can talk about it. And uh, should I use the platform? You don't have MBS tool. You, I will tell. I will set up something so that you'll find the group. Okay.